Hi, I'm Pete McCall, and today on All About Fitness, I am super excited to be speaking with Dr. Diana Hoppe. Dr. Diana is an OBGYN, I'm sorry, a board certified OBGYN in private practice here in San Diego, and she wrote the book, Healthy Sex Drive, Healthy You, and that's what we're going to talk about today, the role that, that a healthy sex drive plays in our overall fitness program. How are you doing today, Dr. Diana? I'm doing great, Pete. Thanks so much for having me. Well, thank you. Now, I was looking at your bio, and I'm always interested how people get into certain segments of their of their profession, but your, your bio said that you started out studying zoology. How'd you go from studying zoology to becoming a, an MD? Yeah, so I've always loved animals. When I was growing up, I loved animals, and I'd cut out the little section from the Q&A of the home magazine on the pet section, and I had cats and dogs, and I just loved animals, and so I got to UC Berkeley and was a zoology major, which was truly a great major because I could do different topics like anthropology and child psychology and a lot of different things besides the bio majors who did a lot of botany and things like that. But while I was at Berkeley, I worked at Cowell Hospital and Cowell Hospital was the hospital there that students went to and I was a contraceptive counselor. And I worked with the nurse practitioners there. So I saw a lot of women and women's health care. And that's when I realized I really like, I wanted to work for women's health. And I took a reproductive physiology class that was really cool. And I thought, you know what? I think I'm going to go to medical school instead of veterinary school. So I kind of made that shift. And then I got to UCSD medical school, which was pretty cool. Uh, so you came down, is that what brought you down to San Diego originally? Was going to medical school here? Yes, I loved it. It was my, my first choice. And I, was, I got into Davis also, but I got into UC San Diego, which was like heaven. And so I was very fortunate. So uh, yes, I loved it ever since I came down here and I've stayed in San Diego since then. Well, for, for listeners that maybe have never been to the UCSD campus, how gorgeous, I mean, where is that located and just how gorgeous is it? Because I, yeah. I can see for the Board of Tourism, they should probably have all people go by that campus at some point. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's like paradise. I mean, basically, the people are really friendly. The views, it's in La Jolla, California, which La Jolla is, you know, the med school was on a campus in La Jolla, but La Jolla in general is a pretty affluent um, area. But the med school is the med school. And I lived in student housing. So, you know, because you know, financially, you just had to be pretty strapped. But in general, the campus is beautiful. The area is beautiful. The people are great. And then that's why I kind of stayed in San Diego, just because I love the environment and the health consciousness everybody exercising and trying to take the best care of themselves. So I love being here in San Diego. It, it, that's one of the nice things. That's one of the things I talk about quite often is the ability to get outside and just be active because I think a lot of people have this perception that exercise only happens in a gym when in reality, it's all about being outside. So as, as when you Absolutely. got into, when you got into private practice, how important is sexual health? Because I think it's one of those things that you hear sex, you, you hear people talk about sex, they might kind of giggle, ha ha. But in reality, it's a very important field of study, correct? Absolutely. And that's why I wrote the book. And I actually have a copy of the book so you can, people can see it's It's called Healthy Sex Drive, Healthy You, What Your Libido Reveals About Your Life. And at the time, I was doing clinical trials in um, something called hypoactive sexual desire disorder, which is decreased sex drive in women. And I realized how sex drive varies over a lifespan. Literally, it can change with the hormonal changes of a woman during their monthly cycle. It can change as we go through perimenopause and menopause. It can change with relationship issues, communication, transitions that we have. So I really felt it was necessary for women to understand that sexual drive or libido is something that's very dynamic. It, it's, flu it's fluid. It's not something that's static. It can change. And that's having intimacy and a good sex life is actually very important for overall health and that and that that's the main question i have is like how does how does like having a healthy libido support overall health i mean what is it about circulation is it about hormone balance yeah. is it just about overall wellness how does the a healthy sex life support overall good health yeah great question the first chapter of the book is all about the benefits of having a good sex life and when i say sex it doesn't necessarily mean having intercourse and like this you know, um, fireworks type thing. It could be intimacy. It could be just being intimate with your partner, even holding hands, basically just having some kind of physical connection really helps with the, the stress, the cortisol levels can decrease and that in itself can help with health. It increases blood flow, like you said, to both the vaginal areas for women, for the best their tissues, for men also, and the brain. It's a form of exercise. So it actually can help the brain also. And it improves longevity. It helps decrease um, the immune system suppression. It helps increase your immune system so that you can actually fight different viruses and infections. So 
having a good sex life is good in so many ways. And it also is a good barometer of how you and your partner are doing with regard to communication, relationship, stress levels, and it can go beyond. So yes, it's a great, great question. And, and I think, that, again, this I think is an important area because yeah, exercise can support, especially as we age, because I know like with, with one issue that men deal with is that as we get older, the body will produce less testosterone, which can decrease or minimize, minimize the sex drive. And so looking at this, what are some common mistakes that people make as, it, as they approach their sexual health? And I know it's a pretty broad question, yeah. but where I want to get to this is how, where do people kind of, if I may use this term, shoot themselves in the foot, meaning instead of trying to develop a, a better sexual relationship, or a more intimate relationship with their partner, how might they deviate from that and kind of build up barriers that would keep them from pursuing a, a healthy sex, a healthy sex life with their partner? Yeah, that that's a pretty broad question, but I think in general the main, I'd say my main point would be communication, because once you lose the communication with your partner and you're not really talking to each other, you're probably not being sexual with each other and having intimacy. And a lot of couples I see, the kids are the primary concern. The mom has her life, the dad has his life, the kids are an entity that they're both trying to take care of, and they kind of lose track of themselves and their relationship, mm -hmm. so that you have the, the woman and the man and then the relationship that's kind of like the union between them. And if we lose the connection of communication and really just listening to each other, talking to each other, basically just doing little things like cooking together, exercising together, having fun rather than always working for the kids. I think that we sometimes lose sight of how can we take care of ourselves and how can we take care of our partners and then how can we take care of our relationship with each other? And we'd sometimes lose track of that, I think with the 24 seven to-do list, the kids going to college, so many factors can intervene with that. No, and I'm just thinking too, Doc, that I think um, one of the issues that maybe I think that some people might deal with too is maybe if they grew up in, an, in a household where sex wasn't talked about or sex was that well we shouldn't talk about that or or looking at it purely as uh, procreation from a certain standpoint are there ways that people can break through that barrier like if somebody and where i'm going with this if somebody perceives that well the only reason we should have sex is to procreate and have children that if, if otherwise maybe we don't it doesn't play that big of a role in our life how could people break through that barrier to understand that having having healthy I don't want to say productive, but having healthy sex can lead to just overall a better quality of life. Yeah. So if there's a mindset of sex is just for procreation, which is why Mother Nature really did have us have increased sex drive at mid cycle when a woman is ovulating and there's more testosterone that she's making too. So she has a higher sex drive and the base of the ovaries and the uterus are working together to really achieve pregnancy. So that's, that's really the reason why we have sex drive. But for your point and the reason of my book is that it can have so many more benefits than just procreation. Because a lot of women may not want to get pregnant and they're using birth control or a man might have a vasectomy. You're still having sexual intimacy, which can have a lot of benefits. So I think um, taking that mindset just for procreation, that could be religious or cultural, you'd have to kind of shift that a little bit and say, what are some things we can do that are fun, that are pleasurable, that you deserve to have? And that's where sex can come in. And it can also be part of just your communication because it's a form of communication and that's relating to your partner in ways that is very intimate. And what, what's the suggestion for that? And, and, and I've, just so you know, I, I'm a fan of uh, the, the sex columnist, Dan Savage. Uh, I don't know if you've ever read any of his, and for listeners, Dan Savage does, I think he's out of Seattle, but he's had an ongoing column for years of where he tries to help readers kind of go through some of these issues. So that's been where I've gotten some of the information that, that I've used. And also, I don't think I've ever told you this, Dr. Diana, is that my father is a uh, sort of, I don't know, he's, a, he's a therapist. He has a PhD and he, he focuses on sexual addictions. So I've kind uh -huh. of heard about, you know, we, he and I have had conversations over the years because when he treats um, addicts, people that have a sexual addiction, one of his recommendations is they start exercising. In fact, he won't work with, he won't work with them as a client or as a patient until they start an exercise program because he feels that kind of goes hand in hand. But the, the, where I want to get to with this is how can how difficult can it be for one partner to bring up an area of interest that they might be a little bit, because my understanding is kinks are very natural. Kinks are kind of like a natural part of our physiology and biology. 
how difficult can it be for one partner to bring up certain ideas or certain um, activities to another? And why is it important to kind of get over that self-consciousness to be able to move towards closer communication? Well, I think that you pointed to it as a communication. I think if you can talk to your partner about what some of your desires are, what your thoughts are, I think it's really being on the same page. Because sometimes you're on different pages, literally, and one partner w might want X and the other wants Z, and they're not coming together and they're not discussing it. Uh, I think there's got to be communication. There's got to be uh, an understanding. There's got to also be, you know, what are certain limits for one person versus the other and respecting those limits? And what is something that is pleasurable maybe for both rather than just one person is just focusing on himself or herself. I think that's where communication and really balance in your relationship and having respect for what the other person is desiring and what you actually are looking for too. So because yeah, and that's one of, but that's, and that's one of the things I've, I understand is from what, from what little I've read and, and taken a look at this is that if partner, if, if partner X shares that they're interested in X, does that help the two partners move closer together? in terms of developing a level of intimacy? It depends on what that is and do both partners want it. If you have a sexual addiction, like, like you mentioned with your father being a specialist, and if that person, let's say if the man is into porn and porn addiction, that can cause a lot of problems with the relationship because he's focusing on that as the primary outlet for his desire. Now that may not correlate with the woman who doesn't really want to be watching porn and be partaking in that kind of thing. And that's where I think sometimes a counselor can really come in because that can help with the sexual addiction, go back to how can the the two of them get back together and what was more of a, the, the previous way they interacted. How were they having sex before the addiction became where it was? And how can they regroup to get back to the basics? It's really about basics of communication and saying, what does my partner want? What do I want? And how can we try to achieve some type of uh, I don't know, balance is the word, but just kind of agreement on how we can get this to work together and respect each other. I think when a woman gets resentful about her husband, like one of the chapters is about communication and what can happen with resentment. So that's a big deal with sex drive. So if women find that their partner is not helping them, like with the child um, care, with work, um, housework, things like that, they're not going to really be up for having sex because mm. they're like, that's the last thing on my list now I want to do. You haven't helped me with the dishes. You haven't helped with the housework. I had to feed the kids. And now you want to have sex? So it's kind of like if men could understand that if you can help women with what they need to do with their just daily activities, that is going to increase a woman's sex drive. That, that's so important to that, that's so important to point out it, because I do think, again, in my experience, is that when you do that, and that that's what I've heard from women, and that's what 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 my ex-wife shared with me is that was sometimes the way to really, hey, if you really want to get me engaged and, and into this, do a little bit more around the house. And sometimes you might think that you're doing the right amount, but it turns out that that you're not. So just from personal experience, I can I can attest that that's a very viable thing. Now the the area of interest, in, and I've had these discussions with my father a little bit, just to kind of get his clinical point of view on that is at where where does it cross the line from having a healthy libido which is an area that you focus on to a, a sexual addiction like what how would you define and i know that might not be your specific area of specialty yeah. but how would you define like where does it cross that line because we can look at anything like people can become addicted to exercise people can become addicted to video gaming at what point does it cross the line from a healthy behavior to something that that somebody might want to take a look at and maybe get some help with that's a difficult question because, again, I'm not a sexual addiction expert, but what I would say is if it becomes the point where it's obsessive and they can't live without it and they can't, it's like kind of like alcohol when you think that, like what's an alcoholic? They can't go without a day without a drink. I mean, if there's a way you can kind of see that there are times that you don't necessarily have to be having sex, but you like, cherish the times that you're having sex, it's not just like a robotic, I have to do this, and this is because I, I feel that obsession or need, that's when I'd say, maybe they should look into having a therapist or a counselor help because there are ways to come back and say, okay, because some of those addictions are because of things that happen in life. And so then if you can address those issues and say, okay, this is maybe that triggered that and I kind of went down that pathway. Let's see if we can find someone to kind of regroup and let's get back to connect to each other rather than the internet monitor and the computer. You know, that's where we can get back to the basics and then communication. Well, it's funny you say that because my father didn't start out to become a um, 
sexual addictions specialist, but his kind of his his practice was was developing as the internet was booming, and it just kind of like one went hand in, hand in hand with the other. Just one second. I don't know if you can hear my dog snoring, but I'm gonna reach over real quick and shake my dog awake just for no, listeners no, and no, viewers. No, no, it's all good. One one second. Now I love, I absolutely love my bulldog. And one of the things I love about her is the sound of snoring because that's like white noise. It's actually very relaxing when I'm riding, but she ha she tends sometimes to plant herself near me when I'm trying to record. And you can hear- well, yeah, she you, wants to be close to you. That's very nice. And, I and, and, I'll, I'll, and I'll definitely take that. And, and so let's get back, because wh what role does exercise play in supporting a healthy sex drive? We talked a little bit about blood flow and a little bit about oxygen flow, but I think, I think exercise really goes hand in hand with being able to establish or being able to, to pursue kind of a healthy sex life. How did the two, um, how did the two complement each other? Well, I think having, being exercising, being mobile, being, having joints, um, mobility, like we talked a little bit, like you want to be able to be flexible, right? You don't have to be acrobatic per se, but you want to be able to be flexible so that you still can do the things that you want to do with your partner. And that could be, again, the blood flow, the joints. When we have more blood flow to our body, we're also having blood flow to our joints and being able to be more flexible and then finding, you know, certain positions, let's say, um, it's very important to be able to maintain that. It's like with anything else, if you don't do it, you're going to kind of lose it. So you kind of use it or lose it type thing. And for women with the vaginal tissues, blood flow is a very important thing because we know with menopause, estrogen levels drop precipitously, whereas men's testosterone levels drop about 10% per decade after the age of like 30 to 40. But women have a major decline in, in estrogen and their vaginal tissues can become very dry and sex can hurt, literally. And that's where seeing a doctor that can help with that is very important. And some men don't know that that's happening to their wife and it's not them that's causing the pain. It's actually a physiological issue that's very easy to treat. And so I would encourage all your listeners, if they are having issues, to go see a doctor that can really help with that because there are definitely things we can do about pain with sex because we don't want to have pain. Well, actually, I think that's a really good point. You're right because I could see where a, a woman might not feel as comfortable saying something with, with, with a partner, with, with a husband and saying, hey, you know, th this really hurts me. And, and I could see easily that the husband would be like, well, she's not that into it. And kind of you create that barrier there. Are those barriers, I mean, once those barriers get, get built, are they easy? Do they stay there or how can somebody break through that? A lot of women come to me um, just for their exams. And I actually always ask about sexual health because that's one of the things I like to focus on as that kind of barometer of how things are going in the relationship. And there are times where maybe sex isn't the big deal because like the COVID right now, everyone's stressed out, the kids are home. There's not as much opportunity, let's say, to be intimate. And that's a very normal situation that's happening right now. That doesn't mean you can't go walking together or go for a bike ride and have fun that way. There's a lot of ways you can still exercise and be intimate by connecting with each other. And it doesn't need to be necessary in the bedroom. All right. So that, that's one point. And then um, basically with just with exercise, the sense of we need to be able to take care of our bodies, our brains. We talk about brains and brain health. We want to age gracefully. We want to keep our brains feeling as functional as possible. And exercise is a, is a huge part of that. Yeah, no, I, I like the fact that, you know, I was just writing a note there real quick because I think to sum it up, I mean, you're, you're kind of saying to focus on intimacy and connection. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But one of the things that also popped to mind we talk, one of the big things I try to get people thinking about listening to this podcast is the idea of overtraining, is that if we overexercise, right, exercise is good for us, but too much exercise could lead to what's called overtraining that shuts down a number of physiological systems in the body or that affects a number of physiological systems in the body. Could too much sex, or sorry, could too much, I don't want to say too much sex is bad, but could too much exercise affect sex drive and how so? Well, that's, that's an interesting point because sometimes for men, if they exercise too much, maybe they, uh, I, you'd have to talk about the testosterone effect. Some women, some men who actually take testosterone shots that can affect their sex drive too, because they may actually become less sexual, they have less drive. Some women I do give testosterone to, and that can increase their, their sex drive, but there can be some side effects from that. And so that's where it's really important to talk to a doctor that can prescribe testosterone because a very low dose for women. And we wouldn't have a very high dose because too high doses can cause acne, skin problems, aggression, irritability. And most women don't want to be aggressive and irritable. 
So testosterone is kind of like a, a very thing that we have to treat kind of gently, but definitely it can be something to help with sex drive. The other thing I want to make sure is that our listeners understand that with intimacy and with sex, whatever way we describe it, we release oxytocin. And oxytocin is the bonding hormone. And that's what you feel connected with your, bo- with your body and your partner. So oxytocin being released feels peaceful. You feel that calm. You feel that kind of sense of pleasure, but it's also connecting with your partner. And that's where oxytocin comes in, which is a hormone that is also released during exercise. See, it's almost like I, and I, I wrote a blog on this topic years ago for, for fitness is that it all comes down to hormones. There's that line in the Fletch movie of it's all ball bearings these days. And if you look at whether it's exercise or, or a healthy libido, it, it can all come down to hormone levels because hormones are the chemicals that really control how our body functions. And so what was what it that caused you, were you hearing something in your practice or, or seeing something in your, in your patients on a regular basis that, that caused you to write your book? And what was it that, that kind of made you take that extra step to provide that as a resource? It was a great question. What happened is I was doing clinical trials for uh, a certain pharmaceutical company. So I love doing clinical trials. That's where you investigate different medications that might help with different potential issues that people are going through. And Viagra had come out probably about 10 years before. And we know Viagra was for sexual men's dysfunction, for erectile dysfunction. And so um, Beringer Ingelheim was looking at a drug, looking for De- looking for something that helped women with they have decreased sex drive. So we had I had to interview women to, to specifically who did not want to have sex with their husband, their partner, not because they weren't attracted to them, not because they were resentful, not because they were stressed out. They just had lost the desire. And when we found in those women is that they had a certain area of the brain that had different levels of serotonin. And so the drug was actually a serotonin reuptake and uptake inhibitor, and it was called flibanserin, which is now called Addy, A-D-D-Y-I. And I think it's with Sprout right now is the marketing person for that. But there is a medication out for hypoactive sexual desire disorder. But the point is, I thought it was amazing when I saw women come in and they'd say, you know, Brad Pitt could walk in the room and I don't, I'd have him take care of my kids. I don't really want to have sex, no matter who you are, George Clooney, Brad Pitt, whoever it is. So they really didn't have desire. They were just like, I just don't want to deal with it. I, I don't have any desire. And so that really prompted me to write the book because it was so amazing to me to see, wow, there's a lot of different issues that go into sex drive. It's not just hormones, which is one definite big part of it, but also other aspects of life that get into it. Well, no, I'm glad you say that because if it's a chemical issue, chemical issues you can address through, through medical treatment, correct? Yes. Because, because I think there, there are two different components from what I'm hearing you. You have the chemical issue, which could be the serotonin, the dopamine, the oxytocin. That, that's a chemical issue that you can address with pharmaceuticals. Whereas on the other hand, as you mentioned repeatedly, you have the intimacy and the communication and that trust. So any suggestions as we get ready to wrap up, any suggestions for listeners on what they can do if they find maybe they haven't been in the mood or if there's been that kind of and you're, I, I hadn't even thought about that, Doc, because you're right. With the kids at home more, maybe you know, with all the extra stresses of, of what's been going on this past year, but what are some, some things that people can get through to try to push through that they might be having a little rough patch? What are a couple of things they might be able to do and push through and, and get on the other side? Well, I think first is just give yourself a little bit of a break and your partner a little bit of a break. I mean, if you're both at home 24-7 when you weren't at home together at all for that, that's in itself a stressor. And men and women deal with stress differently. Men tend to go to their man cave. Women try to associate with their friends. And now with Zoom calls, I mean, people are sick of Zoom calls. So that's a whole nother level of of things. The other thing that you bring up, I want to just briefly touch on, is that men, it's more of a a blood flow issue, okay? Mm -hmm. So erectile dysfunction, you use a drug that helps so the penis comes erect. And it's basically a vasodilator. For women, it's not necessarily a blood flow issue. It's more of a brain slash um feeling desire feeling the need to even want to go there whereas men it can be more of an automatic type situation so i think for the listeners if they can understand that women they need a little bit more like romance a little more intimacy they need to kind of be warmed up a little bit it's not just wham bam thank you ma'am type thing and that if you can communicate with your partner and just really help out in some way and understand respect each other that that adds up to so much for the relationship to to work forward no, I think that's so important because in my experience, Doc, and, and trust me, I've made plenty of mistakes, but I have found that sometimes uh, flowers and doing the extra couple of chores 
and stuff really just kind of helps helps create the tone. So again, you wrote the book, Healthy Sex Drive, Healthy You. Where, what other resources do you have available? Because I know you have some online resources and you started doing a podcast as well, right? And so yes. where can people get more information if they want to learn a little bit more about this topic? Yeah. So first off, the book is on available on Amazon and so they can always get, get it there. But what I'm really excited about is my amazing over 40 website and my podcast. So listeners can go to, and those of watching, to amazingover40.com, and that will get to the website. You can go to my Instagram and my Facebook page on the same, Amazing Over 40 uh, Women's Wellness. And there's blogs, podcasts, uh, videos, lots of amazing information for men and women to understand more about just as we age 40, 50, 60, and beyond, how to live the best life we can from all standpoints. And see, Doc, that's why I'm so glad that we, we're in the same, I mean, we're literally almost in the same neighborhood here and we're doing very similar work. So I uh, hope for listeners, I hope to have her on the podcast again to be able to share information. And I've been on her her uh, resources one or two times. You've had me on one or two Facebook Lives and you've had me on your podcast, which I really appreciate. And again, Dr. Diana, I really, I so, I, I really appreciate this opportunity to have this conversation with you because I really, I firmly believe that as we get older, that that a healthy sex life really just helps enhance life overall and if there are any barriers we should figure out how to work through them and how to really and, and opening up sometimes can be scary but doesn't that doesn't being a little bit scared isn't that something that's good and can lead to growth in a relationship right and vulnerability is a very good thing to have and to have someone be vulnerable and be trusting of their partner and i have some women come in and say you know i don't know how to address this with my husband what should i do and we kind of i say well tell them that you saw me today that you came in for your visit and we talked a little bit about sex and that you wanted to bring it up with your partner. And that kind of gives like a stepping stone to say, hey, you know what, I saw Dr. Hoppy today and we kind of talked a little bit about it. And what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? Just to kind of open the door because if things shut down, normally you're not gonna open that door again. So that's one of the ways I help my patients say, you know, let's, let's talk about this because I just had an appointment and this is something that's been on my mind. Well, I love that because then they can blame the doctor, right? The doctor. Blame the doctor. Absolutely. It's totally no problem. <laughs> but no, but but in all seriousness, you're, you're creating, and that's one of the reasons why I would read Dan Savage is kind of create the conversation about, hey, I heard this today. What do you think about that? And in all honesty, that's why I wanted you to have on the podcast because for listeners, I want you to be able to hear something that Dr. Diana says, and maybe you, you've had that barrier. Maybe you've been around your spouse too much over the last year because because normally in your lives because i think that can be one of the issues right if you and i are together and you normally work i normally work the times that we have together become more special yet if we're both working from home 24 7. Yeah. I, the COVID's made everything much much more let's say challenging but that's where i think if they go to your site some of your podcasts they go to my site the amazing over 40 there's a lot of suggestions i have about how to cope during these times and how to be compassionate. Self-compassion for yourself and for others is really important. Well, it just comes down to communication, trust, and, and intimacy. Well, Dr. Diana Hoppy, I really appreciate your time today. And for listeners, I'm gonna have links to her information down below. I'll have your social media tags, and I don't do this often, but I am gonna link to your podcast as well so people can go there for more information. So I really right. appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It was wonderful being on your show.